Good morning, everyone. Sorry to stomp on your conversations. But we are getting into questions four and six of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And each question alone, actually each of the word, the, the particular words alone could take a whole Sunday school series. So uh, we're gonna move quickly and I'm going to get things started. Um, before we pray, um, you may have noticed I'm not Taylor Martin. Uh, I'm, he, he is away right now. I'm very thankful that he asked me to do this because I share with him a passion for the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Uh, he's become a near and dear friend to me, uh, a, a brother uh, in times of trouble. Uh, you know, he's one of those guys where I can share openly with what I'm feeling at that moment. Um, and he's very understanding. Uh, so I look up to him in, in so many ways uh, as a man of God, a man of intelligence, uh, and obviously he's taller than me. So there's also that <laughs> working in his favor. Um, I also invited the youth up here, hey, you guys, um, because one, uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism was written for kids, right? So none of this, what we're going to be talking about, can, will go over their heads. Um, and they're really smart, so I know they're, they're, they'll handle this great. Um, so I wanted, I wanted them in here. Um, and plus, I, 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 without you guys in my life, uh, my Sundays would be so weird. So it's good to see you guys. Uh, so let's get started with a word of prayer, and we'll get started. Our good God in heaven, thank you that you have made yourself known to us through your word. Thank you that your word is powerful, uh, that it accomplishes what you purpose for it. And now I pray that as we, we look into uh, a brief summary of the many doctrines and truths that we find in scripture, that it will deepen our love for us, that this will not just be a mere intellectual exercise, but this will be a devotional uh, time of uh, looking into what your word says about who you are. And we pray all this in the name of Christ Jesus, amen. All right, so I entitled this lesson Concerning God um, because last week, let's see if I can get this to work, boom. Last week, you guys did questions two and three. So if you are good Presbyterians, I know you all have the Westminster Shorter Catechism memorized. Question one is, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to? Good job. All right, question two. What rule hath God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him? You don't have to know that one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but the word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, are the only uh, rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. And then question three is up here. What do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. So that's what we're... We're digging into today. What do the scriptures teach concerning God? Uh, so in a way, this, this lesson is a, an exercise in what is called theology proper. Uh, not theology proper in the way this is how it's properly done, but it's theology is, and theology proper is referring to the study of God himself, right? So when I said the, this whole series could be taken up by just these few questions, I was not kidding. The, the, the theology uh, of God is something much larger than I can handle in a mere short Sunday school. Uh, in the Westminster Larger Catechism, which I also recommend reading, uh, uh, has more questions and a lot of these questions, the, the extra questions I call them, the extra questions often expand upon what the shorter catechism discusses. Question six of the larger catechism says, what do the scriptures make known of God? The scriptures make known what God is, the persons in the Godhead, his decrees, and the execution of his decrees. Today, we will be primarily focusing on what God is and the persons of the Godhead, right? Next week, Taylor will be back and he will do a much better job dealing with the decrees and execution of the decrees than I can. So for today's lesson, we are going to be what I call looking under the hood. I can't spend an entire series going over each of the words in the way that I wish I could so we're just gonna take a quick look under the hood. Theology is in a lot of way, it's kind of like a car. I'm not a car person, so please do not be offended if I misspeak about what a car is, but I think there's an engine underneath the hood, right? I think, uh, and there, but there's so much more. And it, you need all the systems working together to make a car go, right? So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be looking under the hood, what makes this car theology proper go? But we're also going to be looking under the hood of the history a little bit of the history. And I know Taylor took you through some of the history in the first lesson 
of how the Westminster Shorter Catechism came about, the Westminster Assembly. Uh, today, I'm going to be taking us a little further back because it's really cool for us to hear how 400 uh, odd years ago, a bunch of pastors and scholars got together and they wrote this confession and these catechisms. But what we don't take time to appreciate is that they were standing on the shoulders of 1600 years of history. Uh, the, the early church from the get-go was wrestling with the questions that we are addressing here. So in a lot of ways, these few questions we're dealing with are, are, are a distillation of ages of theology. So we cannot expect this to be an exhaustive treatment of Trinitarian classical theism, uh, but it is by going under the hood, we are going to see and appreciate just how meaningful it is that they, they took these words and they condensed it into just a, a, a short little sentence or two. We're also going to be discussing why is this important? Um, I, I love theology. I love scripture. I am that person. I will read this for fun. I read this stuff for fun. I think it's interesting. But if that was all it was, it was just a fun exercise and making myself smarter, which I'm not very smart to begin with, but if that was all it was, it would be an entire waste of time, right? We want to dig into the, the theology of God for a purpose, and we'll discuss that as we get into it. So we'll start with the first question. Question four, what is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Like I said, we could spend an entire lesson or series just on this. Um, and by way of introduction, what I mean, the very question begs reflection. What is God? We just flew right by that, but it's pretty significant because the question infers that I can speak about God. It infers that I can say something positive about God. For a lot of church history, uh, the different theologians and scholars such as Origen, uh, and a lot of medieval scholars were afraid to make positive statements about God. They were afraid if you said something, God is X, it's just wrong. You can't speak that God is something. You can only say God is not something. So they'd be willing to say God is not a creature. But what does that entail? Well, we can't speak more than that. So the very fact that we are here speaking about what is God, we are about to make positive statements. That's significant. And the reason why the Westminster divines, and I, I, and I think uh, the scholars that spoke of negative theology, as it's called, are in error, is because scripture makes positive statements about God. The scriptures make positive statements about God. So we are going to be discussing God's being and his attributes and the positive statements about them. What do I mean by positive statement? Again, a negative statement would be God is not this. But a positive statement would say, God is this. And the, the first uh, proof text that the Westminster divines give is John 4.24. God is a spirit. And the Westminster, uh, there's, there's a shorter children's catechism based on the Westminster shorter. And it says, what is God? God is a spirit and does not have a body like me, right? So by saying God is a spirit, we, we are uh, from the get-go making a statement that God is something greater than I am, something different than I am in his very substance. Uh, the other positive statement would be from uh, Job eleven seven. Can you find out the limit of the almighty? God is infinite, inexhaustible. You will never plumb to the depths of our God and his being. Psalm 90 verse two uh, speaks about before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God is eternal. God is eternal. And not just eternal, but he's also unchangeable, James 1.17. Every good gift, we know this verse, every good gift and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. And this is what I love about scripture. When you take time to reflect on it, you find these statements that you didn't really grasp onto at the first go, right? So I know James 1.17, I teach it to my daughter, every good gift is from above, but it comes from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. He is unchangeable. 
uh, one way that the uh, theologians will describe God's being is that he is simple in his being. Uh, simple not in terms of easy to understand. That is definitely not what they mean. Simple in terms of there's no parts. He's not comprised of uh, part God this and then part God body this and then there's part God. I have a body and a soul. You have bodies and souls, I hope, right? But God is God, right? And when we discuss his being, his spirit, his infinitude, his eternality, his unchangeableness, it is all built into his being as God. You can't separate them out, right? If he were to fail in, to have any one of these, he would cease to be the God of scripture. Another interesting thing about the question, what is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being. And then the question goes on to say, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. We don't consider those typically, we wouldn't consider that a, a statement of being, right? We would consider those attributes. So these are the attributes of God. God said to Moses, I am who I am. In his being, he is God. That's a statement that we can't plumb the depths of here today. In his very being, he is God. Psalm 147 verse five, his understanding is beyond measure. He is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his wisdom. Revelation 4, 8, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. And power, God is uh, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Revelation 15, 4, which I love Revelation. I know it's complicated and I don't pretend to be an expert, but in the midst of angels worshiping, we get theology. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Worship done well is marveling at the person of God. And that's what we get to see in Revelation so often. So we, we read it so quickly, but we stop and look and say, what, what's going on here? For you alone are holy. God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his holiness. I also really love that the Westminster divines uh, uh, give as a, a text, Exodus 34, six through seven, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. So this, this account is coming after Moses is speaking with God and Moses says, God, show me your glory. And God who created all things by the word of his power, he could have done anything to show his glory, but he chose to pass before him and proclaim. It's a word based revelation of his glory. He didn't come in big storms of fire, which he had done in the past when he was leading the Israelites out. He came in pillars of cloud and flame. Instead, when Moses asked, show me your glory, God gives him a character description. And it's one that is beautiful and worthy of our attention. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. These are the attributes of God's justice, goodness, and truth. A lot of times we, we have a hard time rectifying how can God be just and merciful? And that can be a stumbling stone for many people, but that's, that's what we see at the cross. The cross is foolishness to those perishing, but for us, it's the wisdom of God. In God, justice and mercy go hand in hand, right? Because God is simple in his being. Not simple and easy to understand, but all the attributes of God go together in his person. Do we have any questions so far? I'm going very quickly. <laughs> Excellent. We can move to question five then. Are there more gods than one? There is but one only the living and true God. Such a simple, two, uh, it's a one sentence question, one sentence answer, uh, but boy, are we getting into some deep theology <laughs> from here on out. This is a statement of monotheism, right? So theism is the belief in a personal God, right? At least that's the, the, the textbook definition. Uh, Monotheism would be the belief in one personal God. And only Christianity can consistently affirm one personal God. He's not a God that's out there and doesn't care. He is a God that is 
transcendent, but also imminently personal with us today. Deuteronomy 6, 4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The significance of that phrase, uh, I can't even get into it all here, but it's a significant phrase if you think about the history, right? This is being given to Moses. And before Moses, you had the Israelites in Egypt. And before that, you have Jacob and his family. Before that, you have Israel. And then you have Abraham. And if you remember Abraham, he was called out of the land of the Chaldeans. He was a pagan. He believed in multiple gods in his homeland. And here, one God speaks out to him. And through the course of progressive level revelation and God creating for himself a people, calling them to be his people, and he will be their God, he makes this statement, which would blow the minds, would blow the minds of the hearers. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Jeremiah 10, 10, the Lord is the true God. He is the living God. Uh, now, let's dig into this a little bit deeper. Living and true, living and true. Living is I, I, easy enough to understand, I suppose. Uh, it's speaking in contradistinction to a non-living God, false idols, right? Speaking of Abraham and they worshiped idols, they'd be idols of wood or stone. And going all the way even to Isaiah's time, people were still making idols of wood and stone. In fact, Isaiah in chapter 45 uh, ridicules people. <laughs> he ridicules people for worshiping these idols. He's like, you guys make them out of stood wood and stone. They can't talk. And yet you expect them to take care of you. The things you're making, you give worship. So who's the creator in that situation? So God is the living God, as opposed to the false gods. The true God, this is developing that idea a little bit more. He is the true God in contradistinction to the false gods. Uh, but this is also a loaded word philosophically. Uh, in the early church, they had to wrestle with their monotheism, right? The earliest Christians were Jews. I don't think that should shock us if we just read our New Testament. The earliest Christians were Jews and they believed in one God. And then as the gospel is going forward, people are hearing the good news about Jesus. All of a sudden the question begins to formulate, what about Jesus and the Holy Spirit? How do we believe in one God, right? So the very language of living in true God began to take on a philosophical meaning to repress and uh, denounce heresy. Um, the, the, the idea of true God was actually used to suppress Sabellianism, which is a form of modalism. And those are fancy words, 50 cent words you can take with you. But in short, it means that there's one God who could put on a different mascot at one time. Marcellus of Ancyra would put it this way. He believed in a, there was a monad God, right? He, he was one God, but at different times he would kind of like stretch out like three different faces and appear as the, the Trinitarian God, but based on really bad exegesis of 1 Corinthians 15, he said, then they'll turn back into one, right? So in that sense, that's not true God, right? The, the, he's, he's kind of in, inferring that there's that, um, this language of truth. He's, he's saying, well, these, this isn't the true face of God. So they use truth, the true God to cut that off. It could also be used to denounce Arius, who is probably like the arch heretic of the early church, who believed that, there was a time when Jesus did not, uh, the Christ, the son of God, the second member of the Trinity did not exist. There was a time when Christ was not, he would say. Now he say, he's like the first special creation. He's very important and he's still semi-divine, but you can see already how that language of true cuts that off, right? We don't believe that Jesus is something, anything less than God himself, right? So this language it's very important and it's all packed into these small sentences. So that all begs the question though, we still haven't really answered what even is the Trinity. Uh, and you might've heard it said that the Trinity is a mystery to be confessed, but not a truth to be explained away. Again, all of what we're talking about here could take a whole Sunday school series alone. So I'm going to be going very quickly. I'm very sorry, um, but we can't afford to take much longer. Augustine himself, St. Augustine of Hippo took over 20 years to write his book on the Trinity. I do not have that kind of time. <laughs> Question six, how many persons are there in the Godhead? There are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. 
again, the very words being used here have a lot of meaning. First, they, uh, the Westminster divines give, obviously, Matt, Matthew 28, 19. I say obviously because it is uh, one of the greatest uh, examples of the three persons of the Godhead being listed in one verse. Right? Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Westminster divines also give uh, 1 John 5, 7. Uh, you might be familiar with that verse where it talks about, uh, I'm not going to try to misquote it right here right now, but basically, uh, I don't have that up here due to manuscript evidence. They were using an earlier version of the Bible uh, that didn't have all the manuscript evidence that we have. We have much older manuscripts now. The ESV is based on these older manuscripts. Um, and, and then the older manuscripts, there's not a, a reference to the three persons of the Godhead. So that's just a little inside baseball talk on what's going on behind the scenes. But this language of three persons, <clears throat> one God and three persons. Uh, I, I said I would take you under the hood. If we go back to Council of Nicaea, you might have heard the Nicene Creed. We've confessed it here, the Nicene Creed. Um, leading up into the Nicene Creed, that, that this was what was going on. They were talking about who's this Arius guy. He's teaching this thing about Jesus was created. Uh, we go back to origin and he had this, he didn't like the term, this one Greek word and this guy didn't like a Greek word and they were disagreeing and it is very complicated. So Nicaea comes together and they are wrestling over this question. We believe in one God. We all get that. But how is he one God? But yet we proclaim and worship that Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. That is a big question. So even at the Council of Nicaea, they would give uh, the earlier version of the Nicene Creed. Hundreds of years later, they're still debating these terms. What does it mean to be one God in three persons? Uh, the Athanasian Creed, which came in the sixth century, uh, and this is just a snippet of it, uh, uses the terms as well. We worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding or confusing the persons nor dividing the essence. For there is one person of the Father, and another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is all one. So we have terms like substance, essence, right? There's one essence, one God, one substance of God, three persons. Now we get those words from the Greek uh, usia. I'm not going to quiz you on this. If you forget, that's fine. Usia, which had to do with this idea of essence, an, an, an essence of being. Um, and there's a word, uh, I, I pronounce it hypostasis because I've not taken Greek yet, but hypostasis uh, it describes, it's very, it's a, sim, a synonym. Hypostasis and usia were synonyms. And they both basically meant being, um, hypostasis, the difference was like, it was a circumscribed, kind of like a boxed in being and usia was just being in general, but they used it back and forth and they couldn't agree on what these mean uh, and that was one of the big issues going into the Council of Nicaea. Eventually, they decided Usia describes the essence of God, right? So that when we say one God, we mean he is one substance. Uh, hypothesis was then used to describe personhood, being, right? Uh, so I'm going to pick on Asa here. Hi, Asa. You're, you're one person, right? He shook his head. Yes. Okay. You got the first question right. Um, now, your sister Evie, is she one person? Okay, good, all right. See, even, even the youth can understand the catechism. There we go. All right, are you of the same substance though, Asa? No, that's right, 500 points. They're useless, but you got them, good job. So clearly we understand personhood, that makes sense. But typically when we think of personhood, I think of person over here, person over here, person me, and we might be people, we're all people and we share that humanity, but I'm, I'm not of the same substance as Phil. Um, I'm, I'm sure he's thankful for that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you should be thankful for that. <laughs> right. So when we think of one God, three persons, the, the immediate go-to would be, uh, if we're trying to think in our human terms, we would think of three gods. We'd be guilty of uh, polytheism or tritheism where there's three gods. But this is three persons with one substance. It's not three people standing next to each other in close proximity. If you just take a picture in the dark, it looks like one person. It's one, it's three persons, one being, right? It's one being. And again, this is a mystery to be confessed. 
uh, and a truth that we cannot explain away. It does ask, beg the question though, uh, how can we confess that these, the, the Christ, the son of God and the Holy Spirit are also God, right? And this was true even in the early church. They no, no, one under, like, no one viewed the father as anything less than fully God. But some people were unsure about who's Jesus, right? And at that point, they weren't even ready to talk about the Holy Spirit at the Council of Nicaea. They were just confused about the son and the father. Uh, we do get a little bit of insight into how they answer it with the here. We're going back to the question. Same in substance, equal in power and glory. Again, we'll go to the larger catechism. What do they mean by equal in power and glory? In question 11, they ask, how doth it appear, very Shakespearean, how doth it appear that the Son and the Holy Ghost are God equal with the Father? Again, no disagreement if the Father is God, but how does it appear from Scripture that the Son and the Holy Ghost are God equal with the Father? The Scriptures manifest, and that is a beautiful word, manifest, as in it jumps off the page when you read it. When you read the pages of scripture, it's clear, it manifests that the Son and the Holy Ghost are equal with the Father because it ascribes to them such names, attributes, works, and worship as are proper to God alone. A lot of times the name God is attributed to the Holy Spirit and to Christ. A lot of times the attributes that we went over, right, those are also given to Christ and the Holy Spirit. Works. Oftentimes, uh, if the Father does something, the Spirit does something too, right? Who rose Jesus from the dead? You have passages in Scripture where it's the Father that did it, where it's the Son that did it, where it's the Spirit that did it. So the works of God are in the persons. And worship. A lot of times, uh, we unintentionally will prioritize one of the persons in our worship. But all of them are equally worthy of our adoration. Now, I, I want to give you guys a chance to ask questions. I asked, I went really quickly. So if you have any questions, that's okay. Okay. Well, then the big question is, why does it matter? Theology is really fun if you're like me and you like reading these books in your spare time, which I have none anymore, but that's what I did. Why does this matter, though? Why should this change the way I live? Well, John Calvin would, in his institutes put it this way. There's two knowledges. There's the knowledge of God, who is God, and there's the knowledge of man, who are we. And he, in his institute, says, you know, you really can't understand yourself without knowing God first. And then he went on and said, you know, but you really can't understand God without understanding how you relate to him. So you also need to know yourself. So what John Calvin was getting at is that this knowledge of God and knowledge of man, who is God and who are we, it, it, they feed into each other. They feed into each other. We need to understand who God is if I'm to understand myself. Uh, what does this mean? Well, by better knowing God, we can better understand ourselves. If I understand that God is creator, I understand that I am creature. Uh, and this has broad implications. This will impact the way we worship. If I understand that God is one in three, God in three persons, that changes how I worship. We, we adapt a Trinitarian worship. Uh, a Jewish believer could not enter into our worship and profess to worship the same God if they don't confess Trinity, right? Same with the, the Islamic faith. They cannot come in and worship the Trinitarian God if they don't confess the Trinitarian God. It's a Christian worship is distinctive. It is Trinitarian. And I don't have time to get into all what that looks like and means here, but our worship is unique. Our prayers are unique. Right? We, we address the Father, but you can also pray to the Son. You can pray to the Holy Spirit and you should pray to all three. And you shouldn't pray to them as separate entities, but they are one God. It changes how we pray, right? It also changes the way we live. And what do I mean by live? Uh, I said, if we understand who God is, we understand ourselves, right? Uh, so it's, you've probably heard it said, you can tell me if I'm crazy, but you've heard it said that America was built on Christian foundations, right? And, it, and it's depending on how you look at the question, it's true. Other ways, it's not true. Uh, because there definitely was the, the Puritan influence and they came and they brought the Trinitarian belief with them and they built a foundation on God's word and which they wanted to create their society. 
But over time, uh, the American uh, the, the formulation of American ideology, especially in thinkers such as Benjamin Franklin and picked up upon by men like uh, Tocqueville. Uh, we, we notice this trend to look at the individual. American individualism, where did that come from? Well, it really does come from a, a deistic worldview. A deistic worldview is a, God's out there, it's the clockmaker. He said it, forget it. He's not personal, but he, he, he wants you to live a moral life, more or less, right? And because of that, American culture is broadly Christian, but it wasn't built on Christian Trinitarianism. The deistic worldview that came in uh, through rationalistic thinking prioritized ourselves. And how did that impact the church is the next question. It's easy to point fingers at those outside the church. How did it impact us, right? If we lose our distinctive beliefs about Trinity, what happens to our worship? If we focus on ourselves and we focus on salvation, it's, it's missing the point. Here's what I mean. Some of you are now, he said our salvation is missing the point. <laughs> Hear me out. What is the chief end of man? Yeah. So if it starts with ourselves and our salvation, it flips on its head what the scriptures are about. It starts with God. Our salvation is to the glory of God and for our enjoyment of him. And that's crazy. Trinitarian belief prioritizes God and his gospel, right? The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ came down while I was still a sinner and died on my behalf because my works are useless. In fact, my works are unrighteous apart from God. And that salvation that I am given as a gift brings me into relationship with him. I am made an image, uh, I, I am an image bearer, but that image is restored. I, I, I take on Christ likeness. I live Christ likeness. I live in accordance with the power of the Holy Spirit. But if I remove that Trinitarian understanding of God in three persons, it's just, well, I, I decided I'm going to be a good person. I want to please God. And that's my salvation. And in the end, I'm going to be okay because when you stack up my good works, the bad works, I'm mostly good. Do you see how that makes a difference? And, when, and if you have Trinitarianism at the base of your belief in your religion, it changes how you view the gospel. The gospel is a work of God. God, the father from all eternity determined to save a people. And the son said, I will to the point of death and beyond obey your law perfectly because my people can't. And once I do, I will take them to be my own. They will be my bride. And the spirit rejoices to point all the glory back to Christ and the father and says, look what they did. And he he comes into our lives. He bring, The Spirit renews us, makes us into the image of Christ. The gospel is beautiful when you have the Trinitarian base. Without the Trinitarian base, it becomes a work salvation. Without the Trinitarian base, we, we lose God himself. Why else is this important? And I'll appeal, uh, I'll, I'll appeal uh, to your hearts on this one, right? Uh, many of you are married. For those of you who are not, Asa, it's okay. You're too young. Don't worry about it, right? When you are married to someone, you're in a relationship, right? I, I, you would love the person. You want that person there with you. You want to know who that person is, right? If I say I love my wife and I just keep looking at my phone at pictures of her, I'm like, ah, oh, she's awesome. Hope to talk to her one day. <laughs> that would be a very disappointing relationship. Why does it matter that we know who God is? And the same, it's the, not the same because God is infinitely greater. But by way of analogy, I hope, I, I hope you get what I'm trying to say. We confess to love God. We confess to worship him. In our heart of hearts, don't we want to know who he is? Do we want to go back to the negative theology where, oh, I can't know God in his being. I can't say anything positive about him. And then expect to have affections or ad adore that God. Scripture. The beautiful gift of scripture lets us know who he is. God invites you to know him. And through his word and the spirit and through Christ, he makes possible that we can know him. If we confess to love and adore him, how could we not want to study him, to know him and all his grandeur and his glory? He is far beyond anything we can fully grasp, granted. But that's part of the beauty is that even though he is so transcendent that he he actually transcends our mind's ability to grapple with him, but he is so personal and so caring. 
that he makes himself known through his scriptures, through his son and by his spirit. And you're invited into that. So why does that matter? Again, it changes the way we live. It changes the way we pray. It changes the way we worship. And it changes our hope. I, my hope is not a pie in the sky, go up there and sit on clouds. It's my hope is that through Christ's death and resurrection, I get to be with this personal God, this God in three persons. It changes everything when you have the right foundation. Uh, my last one, and then I'll in, open it up to questions. Uh, you might've noticed the strange picture. <laughs> Strange picture. Uh, this is a, a picture of a Vantilian creature creator distinction. All that really means is that only Christianity uh, affirms that you as the creature are valuable, right? Within the non Christian worldview, there's only one type of being, right? And even Islam falls into this error um, because they lack a personal God. He actually ends up philosophically and theologically being panentheistic. It's, um, so with the non-Christian worldview, everything is just is. In the, not, in the Christian worldview, because we have that transcendent God who is sovereign over his creation, yet distinct, personal yet distinct, uh, we have value and meaning. We can know him truly. Uh, so having a good foundation of who God is impacts more than just how I live, how I worship, how I pray, my hope. It actually changes how we think. It changed, the, the things we take for granted, like science, were built on a Christian worldview, that there is a God who has ordered things and cares enough to uphold it, right? Our, form, uh, our laws were built on this idea of God's justice is eternal and unchangeable, meaning God's justice is the same from one nation to the next, right? So having God, understanding who he is in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth, changes, it changes everything. So all that to say, I have exhausted my time um, most, almost entirely. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, sir. image bearers created in his image, we can't truly image God as a living, rugged creature who lives by separate from our sins and wives, separate from our, our relationship with the Lord, and separate from each other in the church. So, you know, uh, us living in community is is a way that we can image God as God has for all eternity past. Fully satisfied his community in God. Amen. I'm going to repeat that for the Zoom people. Um, I hope you all heard that because it's worth repeating, right? God is personal. He is relational within his own being um, as, as the three persons of the Godhead. And we, uh, we get to mirror that in our, as image bearers and community. And if, we, if we're failing to do that, um, it, it is actually... It actually is harmful when we fail to do that. And it's, uh, yeah, it, that is just a, a, I wish I had said that first. I'll put it that way. That's, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, if there's no questions, um, I will close us out in prayer. And we will, for some of you who have already worshiped with us, I will see you next week. And for those of you, who are going into worship on this Lord's Day, I'll see you in there. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. Thank you that you have made yourself known. And though we cannot fully understand and grapple with it, we are given enough that we can say we know you truly, uh, that you have given us your spirit to lead us into these truths. And when you have given us Christ so that we can see these modeled, because Christ is the, the fullest revelation of you. And I pray now that as we, we go forward that this, uh, this mystery of the Trinity and the, the, the grandeur of who you are uh, will captivate us, will captivate us and change the way we, we live, the way we, we pray, the way we worship. Uh, and we thank you that you are faithful 
to take care of all these things that we ask for. In the name of Christ Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you.